Well, praise God, everybody. Give Jesus a big hand. Praise God, what a joy it is to be here at Victory. The word explosion. You're in for a great week, folks. And it's such a joy to be with Billy Joe and Sharon. And with all of you people that come from all over the world, it's just wonderful to see God's people get together. We come to receive from him. Before you're seated, I want you to turn around, look somebody right in the eye and tell them. I say, say this, say, I believe you're going to get a miracle tonight. Shock them. <laughs> we did have a glorious time in Russia with Billy Joe and 400 of the people from the church here. You have that many people, are they still over there? I met some that are here that said we were in Russia, but we're back. But you, I don't know whether you realize what Victory Christian Center is accomplishing in St. Petersburg. Because of the dedication of Billy Joe and Sharon and their family going over there for the last 20 months. 18, that was two months ago, so it's 18 and two is 20. <laughs> Even though you're not there, it's still going on and the people are there. But whatever has been accomplished because of their dedication to what they're called to do, Thank God for every soul that's been saved. The thing, I've been telling a testimony I heard when I was there through Billy Joe's ministry, a lady doctor, and you've all probably heard it, but you that have come in from all over, this woman worked where that explosion, a nuclear reactor exploded in, in Chernobyl. It hit the, the news. And she had a big tumor as a result of it. And she was an atheist at the time. Didn't believe in God. Well, all of Russia was atheistic, communistic, godless. But because of what Billy Joe has been doing there for the past 20 months, somehow she caught a hold of this thing. And she came and God performed a miracle and healed her of that visible outward cancer. And today she is saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. And she's going around telling Russian people that Jesus is not dead, but he is alive doing today what he did 2,000 years ago. And it was so refreshing. And I think I got that clip on television with her testimony. It was so remarkable. And we were kind of reminiscing a little bit before coming into the service. Russian people are not like Americans. Or maybe I ought to do it this way. The Russian, the Russian Christian people are not like the American Christians. The Russian Christians believe what you tell them. <laughs> and they react to it. I was on Russian television for a year preaching to almost 100 million people covering Moscow. And we got testimonies. The gentleman that invited me over there, I had no commercials, nothing but pure gospel, testimonies, and the miraculous. No address to write, because they ain't got no money. Strictly an outreach. And this gentleman that invited me there, he said, do you mind if I put an address where they can write? I said, if you can handle the mail. 
So he put it on one time and got 125,000 letters. Swamped him. He said, I can't answer this mail. I said, take it off. And he did the best that he could, and four churches has been founded out of them 125,000 letters that came in, people that responded to the truth. What a thrill it is. And then I had testimonies in Moscow of one gentleman who heard the telecast, and he said, I don't drink vodka no more. I didn't waste my time talking about vodka. I preach Jesus. And if you get Jesus, the junk will leave. So he said he got saved and then came to the church that was established and found out there was an addition to salvation which included the baptism of the Holy Ghost and he got filled with the Holy Ghost on his second encounter. And then when he went home, he realized what this thing was he got a hold of. His mama been sick all of her life, so he laid hands on her and healed her and hadn't been saved for three days. No wonder everybody wants to go to Russia to see how they respond, they receive, and then they want to put it to work and make it effective in every life they come in contact with. And I trust that while you're here this week, that you will be challenged because God has a great work in this last day that's going to be done by the body of Christ. This is the day of the believer. And he's pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. The sons and the daughters are prophesying. This is the day of the woman. I said this is the day of the woman. Everywhere I go, I tell folks this, you know. God is using women. You've been suppressed for so long. And I, I, I have the only expression I can use is what Brother Osborne says. Poor devil. <laughs> when we turn these women loose on him, if he thought he had problems with us men preachers, way do the women jump on him with both feet. <laughs> then he's going to know he's been had. <laughs> Hallelujah! It's just about over. It's wind-up time, and I believe God's going to do a great work in this last day. We brought a few books and tapes that we have. I'll just mention this one. I hope there's enough to go around. I am not the author of this book. Brother Allen wrote this book. It's called The Price of God's Miracle-Working Power. We have a half a million of these being printed in Russian. I felt the importance of getting it in Russian. The miracle working power. Everybody's talking about it, but there's not very many miracles. There's a price to pay. And as I said, I'm not the author. I'm just presenting it. When Brother Allen died, they burned these books. I waited until the copyright ran out, now I got it. And I brought it back into print. And if you have a hunger, and there is a hunger in the hearts of every man and woman to be a vessel of his power, there's a price to pay. There's some friends you're going to have to drop. There's some places you're going to have to stop going. And there's some things you're going to have to stop doing. It's a lonely walk with just you and Jesus. There's a price to pay. I know a multitude of preachers that changed their lives in the 50s as a result of this book. And this is the reason why we put it in print. Just ask the gentleman back there for the book, The Price of God's Miracle Working Power. We put, I don't know whether I had this the last time I were, that I was here. But the last time we were in the Bronx, I gave an illustrated sermon. And I used two caskets. And we have a funeral. Paul Bear's bringing the caskets in the tent.
And it's a demonstration is what it is, an illustrated sermon. Trinity put this on about 20 times, and Paul Crouch told me every time he puts it on, he has more telephone calls for salvation than any other program. Because we have a body in one of those caskets. And the title of it is, How to Raise the Dead. And somebody comes flying out of that casket when the trumpet sounds. What to expect when Jesus comes. It is a powerful instrument. And if you have your neighbors, you've been trying to get them saved, in, invite them over for coffee. No donuts, whole wheat toast. <laughs> Brother Cherry will be proud of me. <laughs> and you won't even have to testify or anything. Just say, how would you like to see my favorite TV program? And they'll think Bob Barker's coming on. But instead, it'll be Brother Shambach. I'll preach to them. We'll even give the altar call. If they're sick, we'll heal them. The demon possessed will cast the devil out of them. It's all on here. It's a great video. It'll be a blessing to you. Pick it up on your way out, and I'm sure it'll be a blessing to you. Tomorrow at 1 o'clock, look over your schedule. You've come here not to shop. You've come here to get all you can from God. Don't miss any of the activities that are going on because I believe God has something special for you. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me. I've been wrestling over two thoughts, but I have the mind of God here, I'm sure. One of my favorite books in the Old Testament, I preach from it a lot, it's the book of Joshua, where Joshua was successful in claiming the full inheritance that God had promised his people. Halfway through that book, chapter 14, if you have your Bible, there is an incident in the life of a young man, 85 years of age. Now I have all the old folks with me now on my side. 85 years of age, one of the young men who is encouraging young people how to have victory in their life. And in this 14th chapter of Joshua, listen carefully as I read it. Verse number 6. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest? The thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God concerning me and thee. He's including Joshua in on this, in Kadesh Barnea, taking him back 45 years. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I brought him word again, as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, 
Behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. Now, I can really tear this up. The Lord hath kept me alive. Everybody say that. The Lord hath kept me alive. talking to somebody the other day when they said, isn't this a great day to be alive? I said, every day I wake up, it's great to be alive. <laughs> Tenth verse, and now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, e even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. As yet, I am as strong this day. I think we ought to have a youth renewal service tonight. <laughs> as yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war both to go out and to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced, if so be, the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him, and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephthuna, Hebron, for an inheritance. And I'll stop right there. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the reading of the Holy Scriptures. And I pray that the anointing of God will continue to rest on the lives of your people in divine presence. Minister to the need of every soul that's in this place. Hide your servant behind the cross. Let us see no man save Jesus. Anoint these lips of clay and let them speak as the oracles of God. Anoint our ears to hear and our hearts to retain the truth so that we can become doers of the word. Holy Spirit, don't allow one person to leave disappointed. But let them leave tonight knowing that they have received what they've come for. If there are any here that have never experienced Christ in their life, Holy Spirit, draw them to the bleeding side of Calvary. Those that have come in sick and diseased and afflicted, let it be a time of receiving. And don't let one go home disappointed. Let the healing virtue of Jesus come alive and minister to every need. Fill believers with the Holy Ghost. And I pray, Lord, that you will move in and touch the life of every person. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. And amen. Caleb, 85 years of age, a man who excelled in the faith walk. And yet he is one that never made the Hall of Fame chapter, chapter 11. It seems like he was left out, but yet... He was a man of faith, and I believe it's absolutely essential on our part that we take a look back 
at this man's life and see what it was that he accomplished as a result of having the faith of God in his heart. He wholly followed the Lord his God. Two things that I think stand out in this chapter. God gave him a promise that he was going to possess the land. With such an expressive thought, when he was called to go out as one of the spies, Moses declared it 45 years ago, and he is reiterating it in the ears of Joshua. These were the only two that came back with a good report. These are the only two that are alive. The rest of them... Their carcasses are bleached in the sands of the desert. They never made it in. A new generation has come on, and thank God they had men like Joshua and Caleb to move them in to lay claim to their full inheritance. Moses, as you know, was a type of the law. And most Bible commentaries, commentators, they are commentators, <laughs> declare that Joshua was a tripe type of Christ, but I cannot fit into that particular expression because I believe Jesus was introduced as that stranger that Joshua met before the invasion of Jericho, the night when he met this stranger head on with a sword drawn. If you recall the encounter, Joshua was contemplating last minute strategy before he began to attack Jericho, being the great commander-in-chief that he was, a general in the army with Moses. Last-minute strategy was being planned, and now God has just elevated him to succeed Moses. And he now has a confrontation with a stranger, with a sword drawn, and Joshua pulls out his sword and whips the wind with it, and he confronts him and said, Who are you for? Are you for us or our adversary? And the stranger said, I'm for neither one of you, but I come as the captain of the Lord of hosts, and I come to lead you into battle. And I believe that was Jesus himself who tried on his earthly vesture before he was born of that virgin in that manger 2,000 years later in history. And I believe that Joshua is a type of the believer who moves in to their full inheritance in Christ. Canaan is not typical of heaven. But Canaan is a place where you and I can live while we're living in this world today. There is an inheritance that you and I have. Now that generation that Moses brought to Kadesh Barnea, he brought them to the borders of the promised land. They saw it with their eyes, but they never entered in. Because they listened to ten men who swayed them and their hearts were filled with unbelief. Now every one of you know the story and I like to go back to reiterate this. Because it has a lot to do with the message that I want to preach tonight. Joshua and Caleb was one of twelve. Two of twelve. One out of each tribe that Moses sent out to spy out the land, to see whether it was a good land, whether there are enemies in the land. Was the people great? Was it a land that had good agricultural facilities? 
And they wanted all these questions answered. And ten of them come back with an evil report. You know the story. All they saw was the giants in the land. And fear gripped their heart. And it canceled every other alternative. Now when you read the story, they all come back with the same report. But it's how you say something. The ten came back first and said, We cannot go into the land because the land is full of giants. Oh, it's a good land. It flows with milk. It flows with honey. The vegetables are great. But it's impossible for us to go in and take that land. We are grasshoppers in their sight. And the hearts of the people were turned. You that are watching by television, you have to be careful who you listen to on television. You have to be careful where you go to church. You have to be careful what you listen to on radio. How many times I hear this world say, well, we're all going the same place anyway. No, we're not going the same place. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if I believed everybody's going the same place, we never would have bothered going to Russia. This is the reason why everybody's over there now to, to reach out and, and they're laying down truth into the hearts of those people and to see the lives of those people transformed by the power of God. To see this gospel works in 1993 and it did. Jesus is the same today as he was yesterday. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Now here, ten men come back. This is the first church. And the people, the hearts of the people were filled with unbelief as a result of what they were told. You can't be healed. The days of miracles are over. You're never going to make it. You're never going to prosper. You get the negative report. And then all of a sudden, after you make up your mind, here comes two little old holy roller, I mean two little old holy ghost men, <laughs> Joshua and Caleb, and they're bringing back the goodies with them. They have a, stay, a stave between their shoulders. They're carrying the grapes and the figs, and they have pomegranates hanging, and they each have a jug of milk and a bucket of honey. And they're singing, coming up the road, Marvin. And they're singing, we are able to go up and take the country and possess the land of Canaan, Jordan to the sea. Though the giants may be there, our way to hinder, God is going to give us the victory. Let's go. We're able to go in. Now, did you ever try to convert somebody that just got a false report? I would much rather talk to people that had no report. When I first went to Russia, I, there was no church there. The only one I had to fight was the devil. I was in hog heaven. I felt good. No church to fight you. No doctrines to fight you. All you had to do was stand up and preach Jesus. My audience was under a statue of Lenin in Kamchatka. And I gave an altar call and 10,000 hands went up. I said, put your hands down, you're misunderstanding me. That's that Western mind, see? I said, now, and I gave the altar call the second time. And I said, if you really would like to receive Jesus into your life, raise your hand. This time, both their hands went up. 
10,000 hands. Second time, 20,000. That's both hands on 10,000 people. I said, folks, you're really not getting it. So I started over the third time. You know, here in America, I mean, you, you say, sing the chorus six more times. Is there one that would like to get saved? Please, I'll take you out to dinner tomorrow. <laughs> but this is a new ball game. I tell you, folks, if you're, if you're called to preach, go to Russia. They're, they're anxious. Why, I, I told the folks, I said, I even think I saw Lenin's hand went up on that statue. <laughs> We went into the mayor's office and the governor's office. I mean, this is unusual for me. I felt good. I walked in there and told them, I said, you're cursed with a curse. Your country's cursed with a curse. Your land is cursed with a curse. Your children are cursed with a curse. But be of good cheer. <laughs> Don't that sound like a Pentecostal preacher? You tell them the curse and you say, be of good cheer. I have come to lift the curse if you do what I tell you to do. Hey! I had the pleasure of leading that mayor to the Lord and that governor to the Lord. And the mayor said, preacher, if you'd like to build a church here, I'll give you the property free. Any place you want, you can have it. And I said, wake me up again. <laughs> Not in America. They allowed me to go into the schools and pass out Bibles and pray for the children. This is Russia. You can't even do this in America. <laughs> ah, but this is an update. I just heard yesterday that in Tyler, Texas, the new school board was voted in and they voted the Bible back in the school. <laughs> And we can pray in Texas. Hey! That's a first, brother. Hallelujah! I haven't been back, but I heard it already. Because I met two of those school board members, and they told me, pray. We're going to change this thing. We're going to pray. And I'm saying this on national television now. America, you don't have to put up with it. We can vote them scallywags out of office and put Christians in office, and we can get the Bible back in the school. America is going to have a revival. Shout yes! You have to pardon me. I sort of digress from what I'm supposed to talk about here. But I got beside myself. I just like to share good news, don't you? Yeah. Hallelujah. I thank God for what's taking place in Russia. I thank God for what's taking place in Australia. I thank God for what's taking place down in Argentina. But I'm a hometown boy. I want to see it happen in America. I want to see it take place in New York, in Los Angeles, in Seattle, in Dallas, and even in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I want to see God's power demonstrated. I want to see blind eyes open, deaf ears unstopped. I want to see the lame walk and leap for joy to let the world know God is not dead, but he is alive. Shout yes! Hallelujah! But you see, when you come with a good report, first thing you want to do is kill you. Not the world, church folks. These were church members. These were the ones that came out of Egypt's bondage. These are the Baptists that come through the water.
Now these two Holy Ghost boys found something on the other side of Jordan. They wanted everybody to have it. They brought back the fruit. The grapes are as big as oranges. The figs had something in them that was conducive to healing. The grapes of Eschol. Are you listening to me? When you squeeze them grapes, mmm. That's that new wine of the Holy Ghost, Mama. I don't know what I'm doing over here, but I, I kind of have a feeling you're going to get out of that thing tonight, Mama. I kind of have a, oh, Lord, have mercy. I kind of have a feeling God's going to heal you tonight. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad the water of life is still flowing? Aren't you glad we're living in a day of revival? Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. It's still flowing. He brought back the report. Brought back a jug of milk and a bucket of honey. And said we're able to go up and possess it. Everything in that book that God said. You can put it in the bank. If he said it he'll do it. And if he spoke it he will bring it to pass. Because God cannot lie. Can you shout praise the Lord? Only two. Two men came back. Ten came back with an evil report. Two came back with a report of faith. And say we're able to do it. Let's go. Come on, let's go. And they picked up stones. I mean, brothers. In the church. The ones that come out of bondage with them. They wanted to shut them up. They can't take the message of faith. And they'll try to shut it down. God said to Moses, back them up. They're not going in. I'm going to kill them all. If I'm reading this, I go ahead, Lord. <laughs> but Moses interceded. He said, Lord, you'll have Pharaoh laughing up his sleeve. Just turn them around. And they wandered and wandered. And that's what the church is doing now, wandering in the wilderness. Don't know where it's gone. Pray for me that I might be the daughter God's looking for. I just recognize him. He's from Norway, but he went to Russia with me, with his singing group. It's good to see you, son. They're the ones that taught us the song we sang all over Russia. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the... He's the singer. I'm not. <laughs> Two men that came back and said, we're able to go in and take it. Ten said, you can't do it. And they, the ones that had the influence over the people, and God turned them around. And now here is the man, 45 years later, 85 years old, or young, and he's still a man of faith. 31 kings had to be destroyed and defeated. Joshua, the other one, is now the commander-in-chief. All the enemy has been done away with, and now it's time to distribute the inheritance. And here comes Caleb. 
And he reiterates in the ears of Joshua and the leaders of Judah. And they come and said, remember, the, thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses concerning me and thee. He's going to include Joshua in it now, just one time. But there are five times where it says, the Lord spake. Four times he takes it all to himself. when he says, the Lord spake to me. The Lord spake to Moses concerning you and me. He included Joshua with it. And now everything is personal. I know John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But when it comes into your life, he died for me. He had me in mind. He is my shepherd. Hallelujah. The Lord isn't your shepherd. He's my shepherd. You've got to lay claim to this for yourself if you are going to be the benefactor. If you're going to be the one that benefits from it, then you must have faith for yourself and lay claim to it if you're going to possess it. Can you shout amen? amen. Hallelujah. And here, Caleb is reminding Joshua of what the Lord said. And now he says, before you distribute this land, he said, I'm just as strong today as I was 45 years ago. For war, not for some old age home. I'm not looking for a retirement check, but I'm looking for a fight. I'm looking for a battle. And the enemy's still out there. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. I ain't begging for anything. I want it. He said, do you remember 45 years ago, you and I were the last ones to come back? When God said, every bit of ground that the soles of your feet tread on, you shall possess it. He said, I laid down some footprints around Mount Hebron. I found out where them giants lived. They lived in the most beautiful spot in that land. And he said, I put down number tens and a half around that whole city. No wonder they were last coming back. Too busy laying out tracks. That's the Palm Springs of the land. Are you listening to me? It's the West Palm Beach. Not the Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, and it's gone in there. But this is where the palm trees are. And Caleb wanted the best. Oh, I love this. I would to God we'd have a church full of people on every corner that wanted God's best. Most of us are content with just the good. Just to get by. And then there's a certain percentage that'll want something better and they'll leave the good to get the better. But there's only one out of 10,000 that'll say, I want something that's the best. And the greatest enemy to the best is the better. You get content with the better. But I've come to tell you, there's something else out there that's waiting for you with your name on it. But you've got to lay claim to it and lay down some footprints. God promised it 45 years ago. And it's still good today as it was 45 years ago. Now give me this mountain. He's not asking. Or something that don't belong to him. He said, this is what God told Moses 45 years ago. And he told it in the hearing of every one of us. And we laid down some footprints. Now give me that city of Hebron. Oh yeah, the giants are still there. And 
I'm not asking for these young upstarts to go and do my fighting for me. He said, I'm as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me as my strength was then. Even so is my strength now for war both to go out and come in. Now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. For you heardest that in that day how the Anakims were there. The cities were great and fenced. And if so be that the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord had said. This is my kind of man. This is the day, it's a new day. It's a day when God has opened it up to every believer. The day of the big preacher's over. In this last day, revival is going to be Believers, especially you women. You women have been held back. I had a woman come to me not long ago and she said, Oh, Brother Shambach, God called me to preach, but I'm a woman. I said, Isn't that? A shame. God don't know what you are. <laughs> now let's, let's get one thing straight. There is no sex to God. There is no male and there is no fem- female. We are all sons of God. Even you women are sons. I see somebody going, I'm not here. Yeah, <laughs> yes, you are. How can I be a son when I'm a woman? The same way I'm going to be the bride the next time I get married and I'm the man. <laughs> My wife and I celebrated 44 years together. And I informed her, the next time I get married, I'm going to be the bride. And I'm not going to have no sex change. I'm waiting for Jesus to come. We're going to get married up with him. There's going to be a marriage supper. We are the bride of Christ. Can you shout amen, somebody? Hear me, ladies. I know this has been warfare in the church. In the holiness church, in every church. They don't want women preaching. Hear me, ladies. It was a woman who carried the living word around for nine months in her body. And now they're telling her she can't carry the written word around. Get on out there and preach the thing. If God called you to preach, stand up and let it go. God said these signs shall follow. Then that believe. And if you're a believer, God's going to challenge you and send you forth with power. Hallelujah. Don't turn the television set off. I know I made a lot of enemies now. But I made a lot of friends too. All you women stand up. I'm going to show you how many friends I made. Pan this audience. Raise your hands, ladies. Shout a little bit with me, will you? Woo! So I don't care whether you get mad or not. If it wasn't for the woman, the church wouldn't be where she is today. Thank God for women. I said thank God for women that know how to believe God. Can you shout amen? Amen. Don't turn that television set off now. (laughs) Keep it on. I'm just getting started. That's my introduction. (laughs) Caleb's life was a life that was built on the promise of God. 
Can you imagine 40 years wandering with those unbelievers? I mean, he was right next door to the ones that wanted to stone him. And they're wandering around in the wilderness, but there's something keeping him alive while his brothers and sisters are dying off like flies. And what was keeping him alive, God said? Every bit of ground that the soles of your feet tread on, you shall possess it. And I'm going to keep you alive until you lay full claim to that promise. And one fed the fuel of the other. Every day he woke up, he said, mm -hmm, this might be the day. Hallelujah. I laid some footprints around Hebron. Let them all die off. But I'm going to believe God. That's what I'm trying to tell you folks. I don't care how many of them turn their back on you. Let your faith rest in the bedrock of that eternal word. And let every man and let every devil be a liar. But let God be true. Here's a life that was living in the realm of the promises of God. And the word of God works all throughout your life. Forty years ago, I'm just as strong now as I was 45 years ago. Can you say that today? I got my youth renewed. I had a tent up in Washington, D.C. in the nation's capital some years ago when a man came and he said, I'm a prophet of God, brother. I said, there's a whole tent full of them in there. Go on in there. I got a message for all you prophets. He said, yeah, but I got a special gift. I said, what's your gift, brother? He said, I set people's ages back. Oh, I said, put that gift to work, brother. Put that gift to work right now before I go in there. He set my age back 20 years, brother. Yeah, he did. And when he got done, I wrote an address down. I said, brother, I want you to go to this town. And the woman that opens that door, I want you to lay hands on that woman and set her age back because that woman's going to be my wife and tell her I ain't living with no old woman no more. My wife told me he never did show up. So I had to lay hands on him myself, brother. Lay that, turn that age back. Five and a half years ago, I died on an operating table. Many of you know that. I was very verbal with it, up front with it, put it on television, wrote a letter, everything. I wanted all the help I can get. Most preachers try to hide their trouble. I put it on the front page. I call all the prayer towers I know. <laughs> I call them church mothers, get praying. Stop your gossiping and start praying, I need help. I wrote everybody on my mailing list. I've been praying for you all these years. Now it's your turn. Pray for me. Help! <laughs> Doctors told me I'd never preach again. I said, well, I'll just ask God to take me on home and get out of here. <laughs> well, you might live, but you're going to have to sit down and preach. I said, say what? I rented Madison Square Garden and had a victory celebration. I got that word victory celebration from you, Billy Joe. I wanted a victory celebration. I wasn't giving it to no devil. I turned white, Marvin. Everybody thinks I'm black anyway. I turned white. My hair was gray. I had no blood. I turned white. 
I didn't feel good. I, I wasn't giving in to no devil. I told him I could whip him weak. <laughs> when I'm weak, then I am strong. Come on, shout amen. I went to Madison Square Garden, had a victory celebration. I laid hands on everything that moved. And I still didn't get it. Everybody getting it but me. You ever been there? So I rented the amphitheater in Chicago. Had the second victory celebration. Running out of cities now. 8,000 people were there. I preached. I'm still white. Hair's still gray. I'm weak in the flesh. And I preached, laid hands on everything and moved. Everybody's getting healed, miracles taking place. Everybody get it but me. You ever feel like a little legitimate child at a family reunion? Everybody gone down but you. You want to go down, but you got to make sure the catcher's there. You don't want to feel backslidden. So I rented the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles. One more. The third victory celebration. We got there, the place was packed. I don't know how many seats, seven, eight thousand, whatever. And it was packed. Laverne Tripp was leading the singing. And right in the middle of his song, God walked into that auditorium. Nobody saw him, but he walked in. And when God walked in, Laverne Tripp, bam! No catcher. <laughs> Face first. He fell flat on his face. And when he fell, everybody in them seats fell over the seats. And I'm standing there. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? I'm standing there, Lord. I'm the one called the meeting. <laughs> over here. Over here. Over here, Lord. And then it dawned on me. Dummy me. I'm wondering why God's knocking them all down but me. When all of a sudden, I felt the swish of his robe coming in my direction. And he wanted to knock them all down so he and I could do our own thing together. I didn't see him, but I felt him as he got close. And he wrapped those pinions around me. I felt them as they came around my chest. And he gave two squeezes, Billy Joe. Mm. Mm. And I grabbed that microphone and I preached for two solid hours. I come back, I got what I wanted. My hair come back, my color come back. I'm a soul brother now. Hey! Hallelujah! My wife didn't go with me to California, but when I got off that plane, she met me in Dallas. And when she saw me, she said, wow. <laughs> it's worth it all just to hear your wife say, wow. <laughs> she said, boy, do you look good. I said, say it one more time. <laughs> she said, you got it. You got it. I did get it. I got a touch from God. And I come to Tulsa to tell you, this is your day. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. You don't have to wait until the next day. But you can get it right now. 
It's the God of that Bible that's here. He's in the auditorium, walking up and down the aisles, in and out of the seats. Oh, if you just let him embrace you, you'll be a new person. He'll transform your life. Our last day in Moscow before coming to St. Petersburg, the young Russian fell asleep listening to me preach. I wanted to throw my microphone at him. And I guess it can be a little sidetracking, listen to an interpreter. Can't understand English and the interpreter. And he's sitting in a wheelchair. He fell four floors and he's totally paralyzed. In a wheelchair, sleeping. Didn't even hear my message. And then I laid hands on all of them. We were in the same stadium Billy Graham was in. We had this on video. And he came through. He finally woke up. And he was in a different kind of a wheelchair. The kind with extended arms on him like that would give him exercise when he would use it instead of using the wheel. And I said, I kind of like that contraption. Give you exercise. And he came through and I laid hands on him and nothing happened right away. But there were so many thousands of people I was laying hands on and all of a sudden sounds like somebody just made a touchdown over yonder in that <laughs> arena. And Bill Armstrong, he's probably here tonight. He goes to this church. He takes pictures for us. And Bill got pictures of it. My son was taking video shots. And all of a sudden, I stopped praying for folks. And I looked and I saw that man who was totally paralyzed pick that wheelchair up and run all over that place totally healed by the power of Christ. Never even heard the word. Fell asleep. A miracle. Before we left, he joined the church that was birthed out of that TV program, and his folks lived 2,000 miles away, and he left the wheelchair there, and he took a train to his hometown. He said, I wanted to tell my parents what Jesus did. He got saved that night. He got healed and filled with the Holy Ghost, and now I just got word he's out Preaching the gospel, letting people know that Jesus is not dead, but he is alive. Miracle. Whatever your need is, Jesus is in the house to meet that need. God is raising up an army of believers, of young people, women, 85-year-olds, Nobody wants to admit to be an 85. But God is raising up a people in this last day. Caleb was a man who discovered the secret of perpetual youth. He said, I'm just as strong today as I was 45 years ago. Many of you here can testify to that in your own life. I used to be a pastor. And I'll never forget one of the women came and she brought me a picture. And she said, look at this, Brother Shambach. And I said, who is that ugly woman? <laughs> now that I think back, maybe that's why I ain't pastor no more. <laughs> She said, that's me. I said, you? And she said, yeah, it was me before I got saved. And I said, oh, boy, am I going to get out of this one smelling good? I said, look at what happened to you since Jesus come into your life. 
transformed your looks and look how beautiful you are now. And that's what Jesus does. He gives you beauty for ashes. You were a mess when he found you. You were ugly. But aren't you glad he saved you and washed you, transformed your life, made a new creation out of you? Hallelujah. You got your youth renewed. You're as strong today as you were 45 years ago. Hallelujah. And he said, I'm just as strong for war to go out. And when he saw that mountain, and when the sons of Anak and the giants were there, that spirit was alive in him. I need to be there. The troubled spot. Hear me, church. This is where the church is needed in the troubled spots in the world. We move out. We go into the ghettos. I'm going right now. I told Billy Joe our tent's going up in Brooklyn, New York right now. Right in the heart of the city. Some years ago, we went into Boston. And the police pulled our truck drivers over. Six big vans, big old trucks going in. And they said, are you guys lost? You got Texas tags on this thing. Where are you going? Boston. Well, this is Boston. That's what we thought. <laughs> but what are you doing here in this part of town? We're going to have revival. What's that? <laughs> yeah, this is the right spot. <laughs> Don't even know what revival is. They said, but you know where you are? This is the drug capital of Massachusetts. The police don't even come down here. That's us. And I told my man, when you go in there and set that tent up, hire all the drug addicts. Pay them to put the tent up. But tell them I want them to sit on the front row, opening night. We had 200 drug addicts in that tent opening night. And God set them all free and saved them and filled them with the Holy Ghost and fire. Revival broke out. Hallelujah. It's not time to run from the devil. It's time to run after him. One of you shall chase a thousand and two of you put ten thousand to flight. We stayed there about two and a half weeks and all of a sudden, here comes a man. I knew he he wasn't dressed right. He had a three-piece suit. And he stopped on that prayer ramp, and I'll never forget. He said, I hear what's taking place down here. Can you help me? I said, what's your problem? He said, I'm a crack cocaine addict. He said, I'm a Harvard professor. Can God do this for a Harvard professor? Hear me. The devil not only loves the ghetto, he loves the high rise too. And I want you to know I laid hands on that Harvard professor, and he went down on his back. And when he come up, he come up talking in another language. God saved him, filled him with the Holy Ghost, and delivered him from crack cocaine. We have the answer to the needs of this world, and the answer is Jesus. Jesus is what's needed in America. Can you shout amen? We need Jesus in the city. We need him in the country. We need him in the high rise. We need him in government. We need him in Washington, D.C. We need a revival in America. And it's coming. I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. And it's headed towards America. Revival is coming. And he's pouring his spirit out upon all flesh. Hallelujah! It's going to rain! I said it's going to rain! Folks from Iowa, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota and Missouri, they just came through one of the worst summers because of the floods. But when I was reading this in the paper and seeing it on television, I was getting blessed. 
I said, my God, this is what's going to happen in the spiritual realm. God's going to pour floods upon the dry ground. Revival is going to come to the church. Hallelujah. Don't give up on this church. The church is coming back. And revival is going to begin right in the pulpit and in the pew. People are going to be saved and healed and delivered and filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. Shout yes! Second Corinthians, First Corinthians, chapter 16. Paul says, For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. This is one of, one of the greatest evidences that you're in the will of God, that the devil's around. And some of you have come here to the word explosion and all hell's been breaking loose on you. That's a good sign you in the will of God. That great door and effectual has been opened unto you. This ain't no time for doubting God, but it's a time for believing Him for the supernatural. With all hell you've been going through, you're headed for a breakthrough, and you're going to have the miracle that you've been praying for. Can you shout amen? amen. I believe it. I'll never forget the church that we built in Newark, New Jersey. I used to fly back every Sunday morning to preach until the, those babes became strong in the Lord. This one day, this precious little lady stood up and she said, Oh, Brother Shabbat, that devil been bothering me all week. I said, Welcome to the family. <laughs> she said, But I can't understand this. I've been in the church 30 years and he ain't never bothered me. <laughs> but I came here last week and got saved and all hell broke loose. I said, Touche. <laughs> you said it all, girl. See, when you're playing church, a devil will never bother you. He already got you tied up. But the moment you get delivered and set free, or the moment you're headed for a miracle, the devil knows how close you are to the thing. You're going to find all hell breaking loose on you. You're going to have trouble in the home, trouble in the family, trouble on the job, trouble in the purse strings. But you're headed for the greatest miracle of your life. It's not the time for giving up. The adversary goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Behold, I give you power over all the power of the devil. One of you shall chase a thousand. Two of you put ten thousand to flight. Hallelujah! Many are the afflictions of the backslider. Oh, no. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Who is the righteous? I am. Shout, I am. I am. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but thank God for them holy buts. But the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Hey! Stand to your feet and shout a little bit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you ready for this revival that's coming? Yeah. Are you ready for it? Yeah. It's got to start in you. Yeah. Here's where it has to start. It's going to begin in you and it's going to splash over. Every member you own in your family. Devil can't have a one of them. I said that devil can't have a one of them. Devil can't have your husband. The devil can't have your wife. 
devil can't have your son or your daughter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God said he's going to save you and your household. I'm just as strong today as I was 45 years ago. I'm not backing up, but I'm going on. I see what needs to be done. The enemy's lurking out there. I need to be in the fight. I'm not going to retire. I like what Billy Joe calls this, the word explosion. I like to see it explode in every one of your lives. It sends you forth from here to all the four corners of this world. This is the final countdown. Jesus is coming. He's not coming back for no backslidden church. He's not coming back for a weak church. He's coming back for a victorious church. Coming back for a bride without a spot, without a wrinkle. A bride that's holy. Everybody shout holy. holy. I said shout holy. 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 Without a blemish. Without a blemish. That, he that he might present it to himself. A victorious church. Listen, I don't care how many times you try. I don't care how many times you fail. Jesus Christ is the only one I know that'll pick up failures. Everybody else will put a foot in your face. But I'll guarantee you, he'll never give up on you. He'll pick you up. He'll wash you in his blood. And he'll make something out of you. And he'll turn your life around. Lift you, or lift the curse from you, and you'll be blessed. It can be the night of blessing. I don't know how many's here. But there's always family members that come to Word Explosion. I refuse to give a benediction until I give an altar call. You'll never be able to point your finger at this preacher and say he didn't give me a chance. Nobody moving, please. It's either heaven or hell. There is no purgatory. You're either saved or you're lost. I'm happy to be the one to tell you Mohammed's not the way. Buddha's not the way. Hari Hari Krishna is not the way. Situational ethics is not the way. Humanism is not the way. The Virgin Mary is not the way. Jesus said, I am the way. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Don't get mad at me. I didn't say it. He did. I'm just a newsboy laying it on your doorstep. No man can come to God except through the door, and that's Christ. I don't care how many times you tried and failed. He'll receive you. I failed God when he called me to preach. I joined the Navy. I said I wasn't going to preach, but he never gave up on me. You can run, but you can't hide from me. He found my hiding place. On a 2100 ton destroyer in World War II. And in Sasebo Harbor in Japan, right after the surrender of Japan in World War II, I surrendered my life and made a pulpit out of a five inch gun mount. I've been preaching ever since. Jesus Christ has found your hiding place tonight. You up in the balcony. Every one of you that are standing, just for a few moments. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Holy Spirit, do your office work in the lives of men and women. Every person within the sound of our voice, let it be a night 
of transformation. Devil, you can't have a one of them. Claim them for Christ. Loose them and let them go. I command it. In Jesus' name. While your head's bowed, you that are standing, you feel the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart, you'd like to come to him. Fill your hand up where I can see it while every head is bowed. All over this building. It's a big building. Keep it up there for a moment. Let me see it. All over the building. I see hands raised, but let me do it. It's a better way. Do you have enough of intestinal fortitude to get out of your seat and come down and stand here with me? Without me counting or anything. You want your life changed. Are you man enough and woman enough to get into the aisle and come? Come. The Holy Spirit is giving you an invitation. Play it, brother. Come right to the front. Thank you, sir. Come. Come right on. Thank you. Such a big building. We'll wait for you to come. You're coming to Jesus. I don't care how many times you tried and failed. I'll guarantee you he'll pick you up. Start all over again. I come to you, Jesus. Thank you. They're coming from all over. We're going to wait. Sing it again, if you will. to me I will in no wise cast him out all you have to do is come he'll do the rest thank you thank you they're still coming glory to God hallelujah This is one thing you don't put off. This is one thing you don't say, I'll think about it and come tomorrow. It don't work tomorrow. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. You feel the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart. He wants a response out of you. You either accept Him or you reject Him. You don't put this off. I sent somebody God's given the last call to. Get out into this, out of your seat, and get in that aisle and come down here. Sing it. Sing it again. Sure. Come. Please don't turn him aside. The Holy Spirit is inviting you to come.
Sing it one more time. This is it. This is your night for a miracle of salvation. Transformation. You're coming to Christ. Father, I thank you for being so faithful in drawing men and women to the bleeding side of Calvary. Do a work of grace in their life. Transform them by your power. We're serving notice on the devil. He can't have a one of them. He can't have a member of their family. These people don't know what they're starting tonight. But Lord, you will not quit until every member of their family is brought to the foot of Calvary. I want everybody to raise your right hand, if you will, please. Audience, you too. You that are watching by television, dial that number on your screen. If you were here, you'd be in this altar call, but you're in your home. This is how you do it. You dial the number on your screen. Counselors are waiting to pray with you. I want you all to repeat this prayer after me. Say it for a loved one, if you will. Say, Father, Father in, Jesus name, in Jesus' name, I come to you today, I come to you today and I come, as a sinner. I come as a sinner. I confess my sin. I, confess my sin. I, repent, of my sin. I repent of my sin. Lord, that means I turn my back on sin. Lord, that means I, turn my back on sin. I made up my mind. I made up my mind. I'm going to serve the Lord. And make, heaven my home. and make heaven my home. I'm through with the world. Through with the, world. Through with the flesh. Through with the flesh. Devil, Devil. I'm, through I'm through with you. I choose Jesus Christ. I choose Jesus Christ. As, my Lord and Savior. as my Lord and Savior. I believe with my heart. I believe with my heart. And I confess with my mouth. I confess with my mouth. God raised Jesus from the dead. God raised Jesus. Lord, you said if I believe that. Lord, you said if I believe that. And if I confess that. And if I confess that. Then I'm saved. And I'm saved. You cannot lie. You cannot lie. Devil, did you hear that? Devil, did you hear that? God said I'm saved. God said I'm saved. I believe with my heart. I believe with my heart. I confess with my mouth. I confess with my mouth. God raised Jesus from the dead. God raised Jesus from the dead. God said I'm saved. God said I'm saved. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For saving my soul. For saving my soul. Put up both hands and thank him now, will you? Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you. Send the word of God to every member of their family. Bring them to the foot of the cross. And don't stop until every one of them come to Christ. In Jesus' name. Billy Joe, would you come, please?